Greetings. Uh, my name is David Havlin. I'd like to talk to you about considerations in uh, purchasing a telescope. We get asked this question very commonly at uh, star parties, so I'd like to take a, quite a number of minutes and address it here. Um, I'm based here in the Houston area where we've got the Fort Bend Astronomy Club, Johnson Space Center, Houston Astronomical Society, North, North Houston Astronomy Club, as well as the uh, George Observatory and Insperity Observatory, and I encourage you once this pandemic is over to go visit those two observatories because they are they're quite a treat and quite a place to uh, quite a place to visit and see the night sky the uh, question we get a lot is what sort of telescope should we buy and that's kind of like asking somebody to buy a car for you uh, you may have your heart set on an f-250 and they're gonna come back and suggest a smart car well, that's probably not quite what you're looking for. So as I was said, this is an informed, and it is a needs to is needs to be an informed and personal choice. Our first recommendation is if you don't know, don't buy one. Um, please avoid impulse buying. You can do impulse buying at the grocery store, but not when looking at a telescope. Just don't open the wallet. Do you need a telescope to see what is up there? No, you do not. First thing you need, though, is some relatively clear skies, and the second thing you're going to need is kind of a map of the skies. Uh, I like this uh, Terrence, uh, Terrence Dickinson Night Watch. It's very handy. It's got some charts in it that I'll show you later on. Good star wheel. You can find these at um, uh, Half Price Book or uh, Barnes and Noble, and also you can get star, uh, star charts uh, from Sky Maps on a monthly basis, and I'll show you these. Uh, I'll show you these in a little bit. A uh, pair of binoculars, if needed. You can all, we'll talk about telescopes after we talk about binoculars. Here's what the star chart looks like for June of 2020. It's an evening sky map. These are PDFs that you can print and they're free. Gives you the idea of what's going on with the northern hemisphere. You can also get them for the southern hemisphere. You've got a sky calendar over here to the, to the left. Symbols of what things are on the map over here, down here on the right. When you flip the map over, it tells you about the celestial objects, gives you an astronomical glossary, uh, what can be seen with a naked eye, what can be seen with binoculars, and what can be seen in, what can be seen in a telescope. This is actually a very handy thing to have. Now if you move up a little bit, you can get the Pocket Sky Atlas also from bookstores and from uh, Amazon. Uh, it's got quite a bit of information in there. It's really, really good. Make sure you get one that is dew resistant, so if it gets wet, it's not the end of the world. You can just wipe it off and, 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 and go from there. It's got quite a bit of information. For example, here the upper half of the Orion, uh, Orion constellation and what you would see in a Telrad. And we'll talk about Telrads as we go. But it gives you the relative size of stars, what, where, where galaxies and where nebulas would be. This is an extremely handy guide. And it's like about uh, $19, $19 on Amazon. A nice chart legend. And we go from there. Outside of clear skies and a map of the, scar, uh, stars, uh, map of the skies, a um, good pair of binoculars would be good. Uh, Let's talk about binoculars. Binoculars are a good place to start. They'll give you the forest view, if you will. They'll give you the, 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 the perspective of what's going on. Decent binoculars starting at 7 by 50 are a good place to start. 7 is the magnification. 50 is the diameter of the, uh, diameter of the front objectives in millimeters. So up to 7, 8, 9 can be handheld. Anything much above 10 are best mounted on tripod as they can be uh, modestly heavy. I have a pair of 15 by 90s and they weigh about two and a half pounds. I usually mount them on a uh, uh, tripod. I've got a couple of 7 by 50s that I'll, I'll use by hand all the time. If you're serious about binoculars, mounts can be made. If you're so inclined and have the, uh, have the, the the skill set in the in the wood shop. You can also buy uh, mounts for binoculars. I do recommend you double check uh, the specs and make sure you don't overbuy the binoculars for the mount. Make sure the mount can handle what you've what you've purchased. Uh, for the backyard, um, this is a good place to start. Uh, you may have to travel in search of darker darker skies. 
I do recommend a chaise lounge because the uh, uh, armrests are often a good place to put your elbow. We do recommend bug spray, particularly in the Houston area. So that's where the, the reference of, of off comes from. Alright, let's talk about telescopes. This gets complex and is a personal choice as I mentioned. Please avoid what we call holiday scopes. Excuse me, these are scopes that are sold only on the basis of their power. Please avoid them at all costs. Basic recommendation, please avoid the big box stores and discount stores at all costs. The scope is sold solely on its magnification. When you see that, walk away. You see something Galaxy 675? No, you're not going to get 675 power out of this scope. This scope will be a severe disappointment. Many of the images on these boxes are artist renditions, hand painted, or they are pictures from the Hubble telescope. Anything that's based on power, walk away. These holiday scopes are bought uh, um, usually from discount stores on September onward through Christmas. I've uh, short-circuited a few people from buying them at box stores myself. You'll see them going on for around 100 to 125. They usually have very poor optics. For about 100 to 150 more, you can get a good quality scope that can last a lifetime and render many hours of viewing. The problem with these holiday scopes is that they're based, their product is based on magnification, not resolution. And resolution is the most important characteristic and factor in considering a telescope. Big difference between magnification and resolution. Here's the Houston Astronomical Society. And what I've done is I've taken one of the letters here and really blown it up. Can you tell which letter it is? Resolution is key. And the problem is once we have magnification power exceeding resolving power, it's going to start getting blurry and increased magnification is just going to make the blurry blurrier. So this is what we call empty magnification. And before I leave the slide, I'll give you a little hint. This is the I. But it could have been the L, could have been the M or N. But you can't tell. And this, this, is, this leans exactly to the point. Resolution is key, but magnification is only part of the picture. So the rule of thumb is you'll get 40 to 50x, 50 power per inch of aperture, and that assumes the lens or the mirror is decently, is, is decently crafted and is of a decent quality. So a 2-inch scope might get you about 90x. There's no way you're going to get that 675 out of that 2-inch scope. Mathematically, you can. Practically, you cannot. A good 11 inch scope will get up to about 490. 36 inch, that's what we have at the George Observatory, can get to about 1440. But aperture is key, but as the aperture goes up, so will your cost, and that's another factor you have to consider. Let's talk about the three different types of telescopes. This particular one is like called a refractor. It's much like what the, the pirates used back in the day, what surveyors use today. Um, Focal length is the length of the tube. It can be used both night and day for terrestrial work. It requires very little maintenance. Uh, superior optics, the light comes in, comes straight out, and here's a, perf here's a, a simple example of a refractor on a uh, alt azimuth uh, mount. Superior optics and clarity, if it's of good quality, uh, the catch is the money is going to skyrocket once you get past about a four inch aperture because this is glass up here and you're talking about a refined piece of glass that's more than four inches. Your price is going to go up. So your transportation issue. Aperture though is key. I do recommend no uh, uh, disclaimer. Uh, uh, this is the website for the Orion Telescope. It's a great place to go and learn more about scopes. Here are examples of refractors. These are high-end refractors from Takahashi. Um, you are probably looking at about $12,000 right here. So you want to be very careful. These are very, very good scopes. There's one here and one here. Let's talk about a reflector, the second type of telescope. Here, the primary mirror is down here. The secondary is up here. The light comes down, hits the primary, goes to the secondary comes out the eyepiece, much like what this one is here. 
outstanding optics, often drop and go to a point. Focal length is the length of the tube. They're very economical. Get a big bang for the buck. It's hot, usually a highly recommended uh, starter scope. The disadvantage is they may not be so portable once you get above about 10 inches of aperture. You get, a bunch of, get about a 10 inch mirror. You add clock drive, encoders, go to, and uh, you'll add to the cost and a little bit of the weight and the setup time too. You can also build your own. These two gentlemen have built these. These wheelbarrow handles are for the transportation side of it. Wait a minute, where was the tube in that? Well, the tube is taken out by these trusses. And this makes it fairly compact and, uh, and portable. These are pretty, pretty decent size scopes. I do not recall the specific dimensions on the mirror, but I think this is 18 and 14. I'm not 100% sure. You can go even larger dobs like this. You just wheel it around and point. This is in a very large one. I believe this is the largest amateur, amateur dob that's out there. I think it's something like 70, 77 inches. These ladders are not for decoration because the eyepiece is up here. And in this case, as this gentleman showing you, the eyepiece is over here. So you've got to get up that ladder, be very confident on the ladder to do the observing. So as I said, yeah, it's just not for decoration. They do make what are called Newtonian reflectors, like such as this one, on an equatorial mount. Here is your standard uh, dob. We'll be talking about that as we as we go further into this talk. Third basic kind of scope I want to talk about is a Schmidt Cassegrain. It's compact. Light passes through the short tube three times. The focal length is three times the length of the tube. Disadvantage its cost. They tend to be a little on the higher higher price side. They tend to be heavier, uh, often with heavy mounts. The light comes in, hits the primary, hits the secondary, and comes back here for the tube. It comes out the back side of the back side of the scope. Here's an example of one on an equator German equatorial mount. Um, this is rock steady for imaging. Cost, portability, and setup time takes me about 20-25 minutes to fully assemble this thing and about another 15 to align it. So I'm looking at 35 to 40 minutes before I'm doing much with it. I will usually check the weather and make sure I've got two or three good clear days before I uh, uh, set this one up. Oops, whoops, wanted to go this way. What is power then? We never really addressed that. Magnification power is computed by dividing the focal length of the scope by the focal length of the eyepiece being used. So if I take a 13, the, the dob that I, one of the dobs that I showed you, this 1300 millimeters, and I'm putting in a, a 25 millimeter eyepiece, then with that eyepiece, I'm looking at things in the sky at about 52x. If I take that 3000 millimeter um, Schmidt Cassegrain in the previous slide with different eyepieces, I'll have 32 millimeters for 94, 25 for 120. Seven and a half for 400. Make sure that we stay visible. Again, aperture is key, and it's a function, really a function. Power is really a function of what uh, eyepieces you put in front of it. Choice depends what you want to do. Do you want to observe, take an image? What sort of mount do you want? Portable. What are you going to transport it in? You can't take one of those massive dobs in a smart car. That's just not going to work. But the rule of thumb is get the largest aperture your budget and significant other will allow. What kind of scope? Do you, what kind of scope are you thinking of? What do you want to do? Do you want to do uh, basic observing? Do you want to ultimately consider uh, imaging? These are all things you have to consider. I suggest you go to Star Parties. I'll come up with a list of uh, at least in the Houston area the um, the astronomy clubs. Try to find. I'll talk about uh, uh, how to locate a club in your area toward the end. But I want you to not only look at at the stars, but I want you to look at the scopes as well and see what you like and what you don't like. As I said, we want you to make an informed choice. Extras, mount and accessories will add significantly to this cost. Equatorial mounts, rock steady for imaging, such as this one, will bring the price up. Go-to capabilities will add to the cost of it. Um, it's not uncommon for astronomers to have uh, more than one scope. I've got this one, and I've also got this one. If I want to set up for two or three days, 
an image, I'll use this one. If I just want to drop and go, I'll pull this one out of the closet and I'm up and viewing in five minutes. It depends what you want to do. Sight unseen, I usually recommend a 10, I'm um, sorry, a 6 to 8 inch daub. Not uncommon, as I said, not uncommon for, for astronomers to own multiple scopes. Um, a scope like this is easily portable. These are springs that hold the, hold the, the tube onto the mount pop the springs. You can put this into the car separately, you can put this into the car separately. It doesn't have to be transported as an entire unit. Go-to's or not to go-to's. For starters, uh, we strongly consider people suggesting folks learn uh, what's, what's called star hopping in the sky, to learn your way around the sky. You need to be able to know if the go-to is correct or not, but as you add go-to's or encoders, your cost will come up too. I'll bring this up again a little bit more later on. You want to build your own? Sure. What's this one made of? These are weights you can uh, find at uh, you know uh, um, sporting goods stores, um, plates and everything you can find, little motors I'm sure you can find. Well, this gent is one of those guys who can look at something and say, I can make something out of that, and that's exactly what he did. The two components of this are actually an above, -bound, above ground pull filter. The upper band up here is this here and the base of this is the base over here. There you go. <laughs> Excuse me. Basic daub is, basic, is a metal tube in this case made by Orion but you'll often find a number of daubs are made with sono tubes straight from Home Depot and Lowe's. All you really need is the mirror, a way to mount that secondary mirror and a spine and a place to mount uh, a focuser and a sono tube will help will, will work quite well. Go to cost too much looking for alternatives. You can modify scopes yourself very easily. If you have the skill set, people have often made their own bases. This is clearly um oh I just dropped the name of this plywood. Um but you can cut it and mold it. Oh, I'm sorry, you can cut it any way you want and um, style it anyway, uh, set up your equipment on it, and uh, and go from there. It works out real well. Here's a daub that's made with a, uh, a sono tube. I think he's wrapped it a little bit. The base, is, again, is a kind of a box that wraps around the tube, and he's got it sitting here on the semicircle. These white things here are nylon riders, so we can move the scope up and down. The plate is, actually, is not shown well here, but we'll go down to this one. This bottom plate is actually a triangle, is what's shown up here. And then the circular plate rotates, and the whole scope can rotate 360 degrees. And what you see here is something equivalent to a Lazy Susan. And the scope is a the top plate with the scope is attached to this. These provide a little bit of friction so that it stops when he needs it. But you can also get this, if you don't have the Lazy Susan, you can also do this with um, a large sheet of Teflon. I've even seen people use old records for it. So there's quite a bit you can do. But you can also make modifications to find objects. This is an application called Sky Safari. I'll talk about it shortly. Uh, it gives you for a given object an azimuth and an altitude. What can you do with that information? Well, this is your azimuth right here. 000 is due north, here's 350, here's 355, here's 005, 0010. North is there. If this is lined up due north, and you've got the coordinates 3, 276 and 31, you spin this around till you get to 276. This is on the tube itself. You raise this until you're at 31 degrees, and if your timing is right, the object that you're looking for should be in the viewfinder. Now the scope's got to be level. These are modifications people make to their scopes all the time. Scope's got to be very, got to be pointed very close to, to to north celestial pole or due north as possible. Any error will be proportional. You want to try to keep that error below a couple of percent. Let's talk about assisted setups. Go to computerized systems, drive the scope to a desired object, but you've got to do quite a bit of setup. You've got to align it to the North Pole, so the North Celestial Pole. 
and this actually this lid here pops off and there's a small scope through here and the I look the goal is to actually try to view Polaris through the long axis of the scope. I have the scope up here, tell the computer where a couple of alignment stars based on longitude and latitude, it now knows where things are in the sky and you can go to them. There's also what's called push to computerized system though where you are the motor and you manually move the scope to where the computer says to says to. You align the scope on a couple scar stars that you likely need to know and have a, a star chart handy. Select a desired target and zero it out. In this case, this person's selecting the Orion Nebula and it's saying go in that direction to 174 and go here down to 36. When both of these read zero, hopefully the Orion Nebula will be in the uh, in the viewfinder. So push to is often called encoders. You may see that. that may be a slightly older term. So what can you see in a scope? Well, this is actually the Orion Nebula, I'm sorry, the Orion uh, Constellation. Uh, part of it's not quite completely there. There's parts out here and parts up here. This is Betelgeuse. Here's Rigel. Here are the three main belts, three main stars of the belt. And down here, around where Orion is, Orion's knee is, uh, is M42 and M43, the Orion Nebula. This is a highlight in winter. It's a beautiful thing to see in a scope. If you've got an 8 inch scope or a 6 inch scope, it will be incredible to see. This is a photograph from uh, this gentleman's backyard in Ontario, Canada. There's his website 43, 42. This is a planetary nebula. This is a place like this is where stars and uh, planets are born. It's, a, it's one of the one of winter's uh, outstanding objects. You'll also see things, galaxies, usually in blues and black, grays. Same thing for the Dumbbell Nebula, also in blues and grays. And I'll tell you where to find these in some upcoming charts, because we've got to talk a little bit about star hopping. Smart tools to use. What I handed up to this point were books and sheets of papers you can get out of your printer, but this is something for the smartphone. SkyMap is, I believe, as a droid. I think there's something very similar for iOS. Um, it's very easy to use. IDs, planets, stars, and helps you learn the major stars in the sky. This is an important thing. So you want to know where Vega is, where Interim um, is, and other stars of that nature. Um, very easy to use. However, if you look at an object and you click on the object, it's not going to tell you a lot about it. That's your price for being free. Uh, it's good for learning the, learning the skies and learning your major stars. If you want something that's going to give you a little bit more information, there is Sky Safari. And it is it costs, but it's very good. It's fee-based, it's intricate, it's got a deep software. Uh, if you learn it, um, you can, you can um, configure it to, Figure, ah, you can configure it to drive a telescope with it. Uh, I often use it at the George Observatory. Uh, somebody will ask me, oh, how, how far away is such and such? I don't have that stuff memorized. I'll pull out Sky Safari and say, oh, it's 2,700 light years away, and it's so many light years across. It's a very handy app. Second big step is learning what major stars and what points to what. We strongly encourage everyone to learn to star hop. It will take time and it's crucial to your operating computerized systems. You need to know, just like with your car's GPS, when your car tells you to turn right and you know better and you know that you need to turn left, you need to know that your push to or go to are going in the right direction. So it does help to know where your major stars are. So the catch is, and I'll repeat this in the next few slides. Find a constellation you know, usually the Big Dipper or Orion. Start with that one and then find out where it points. In this case this points to Polaris and Polaris kind of leans over here to Cassiopeia. These two over here lean up to a star called Capella, Castor and Pollux and Gemini, Regulus. The tail of the Big Dipper leans down toward Arcturus these two over here lean toward Deneb and Vega. We'll talk about these in a little bit.
Big Dipper is pointing over, over here to Polaris. You can kind of start seeing once you get one constellation. Alright, there's no easy way to round, around this. It will take time, but it will be worth it in the end. Again, Ursa Major here pointing to Capella, Castor Pollux. These point over here to uh, Orion. And you just go from one constellation to another, and once you're familiar with that, when you kind of leapfrog to another, it's the best way I can describe how to do it. Now you remember those two stars, Vega and Arcturus? Well, between them we've got Coriana Borealis and Hercules, and over here we've got Cygnus. But here they are again in a different program called uh, Stellarium. Those previous slides were from um, Terence, uh, Terence's book. Uh, this program is Stellarium. It's free, and it runs on Windows, Mac, and Linux, and it's very, very good. It's fairly, fairly easy to get going. It tells you what's up in the night sky right now, and it too is uh, sophisticated enough that you could drive a scope with it. So let's come back to Cygnus and Lyra, these two, Vega and Denim over here. What can you see if you can find Vega and you can find this constellation sitting right here and if you're in dark enough skies you can actually make out these two stars come down to that midpoint and you're actually going to see this guy, the Ring Nebula. Same thing for Cygnus, Deneb over here. This actually makes the Northern Cross in the North American sky. Just kind of basic geometry is how I think of it. Same stretch down here, same stretch over here, come right here to M27. It makes almost a rectangle, if you will. And you can see an object that looks something like this. Now this is in reasonably dark skies. Um, now both of these are in color because these are photographs. Uh, by your eye, these will come up in grays and uh, blues, and they're still very spectacular, even even by eye. Hercules, that one that was in the middle over the middle of between Corona Borealis and the other one, there's a keystone made up of four stars. If you find this upper one here, it's only magnitude three five. It's not going to be too 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 dim. It should be fairly easy to find in most guys come down part way and you'll see this globular cluster. It's one of the finest clusters in uh, the northern sky. Uh, and it is packed. Each of those is stars. There are galaxies tucked in there too. It's, it's, it's just an incredible, incredible object to see. The Big Dipper. There's some major. Remember this guy points off to the Polaris. You come around here to the bend if you come back to here, Alcade, between Alcor and Alcade, and come about half the distance, swing down 90 degrees, M51, there's a, there's a gorgeous galaxy right here. Again, if you come back to Alcor and Alcade, and kind of do a semi-isosceles triangle, just lean it to the left a little bit, you can come up with another galaxy over here. The sky is full of these things. It's just incredible what's in there. You have open clusters, globular clusters, galaxies, planetary nebulas, all kinds of other d multiple different types of nebulas. It's really amazing, everything that you can see. And also, let's go right here. Here's the Big Dipper again. It's upside down. Here's the handle. These two back here, Mizar and Alcor, it's a double star, two-star system. And those two star double stars are often kind of fancy and fun to watch too. So again, set yourself up with a map to start learning the skies. Pick up this book if you'd like. Um, pair of binoculars is a good way to start, and we'll go from there. Then you can move on to the, the, the smartphone objects such as uh, sky maps. Okay, little digression. The moon. It's up there in the sky. Brutal truth is most of the general public that shows up at outreach events have often never seen the moon through a scope. They look up at it and just see it with a naked eye. But in a scope it is uh, spectacular and is a very popular item at outreach events. 
What makes the moon a special object is it doesn't matter if you live in the rural area or the middle of the bright city. Uh, the moon can always be readily observed. It can be a problem if you want to observe deep space objects, but it's there out there and it's not going anywhere and you may as well look for it. My favorite phone app is called Lunafac. It draws the current phase of the moon depending on the date and time. Swipe left to increase or decrease the day. It pretty much does everything for you. Lunar calendar will give you the whole view of the month. It tells you when the moon's going to rise, when it's going to be straight up, when it sets. Uh, not straight up, but highest, its highest point in the sky. Also tells you when sunrise is, sunset, sunset when twilight ends. A very, very handy app. <clears throat> Here's a picture of the picture of the moon, just to get some landmarks. Mer Tranquility. We landed right about here 51 years ago. Let me. Got Mare Serentialis. Serentitatis, I'm sorry. Mare Ibrium. We've got various craters over here. I'll talk about, I'll show some of these in higher detail. Here's something to think about. We've got this big one right here, Copernicus. You can see the beautiful rays that are coming off of it. And you can see it's rimmed completely all the way around. Nice circle. Got it? Here's another nice circle right here. Yeah, this was an impact. Mary Abraham was an impact crater. I forget how big the impactor is. I think it's something like 250 kilometers. It was a massive hunk of rock that made that that, that made this uh, crater. Now this hit when the moon was largely in its, I won't say liquid form, but semi-solid. This is all a sea of lava, as are these. These were at one time seas of lava. These mountain ranges occurred after the, after the moon started to solidify with additional, uh, additional and further impacts. The moon is a reflection of what the Earth used to be. So let's dive into the moon just a little bit. Here's that crater I was talking about. This is Copernicus. Depth, diameter is 93 kilometers across probably 40, 40 some odd miles depth, about three, three kilometers down, about 800 million years old. This was taken by Robert Reeves of San Antonio, one of the better lunar photographers out there. <clears throat> These three craters, Ptolemus, Alphonsus, Arzachel, three completely different craters at, taken at three completely different time points. This is probably the oldest, intermediate, and youngest crater. This is the Great Wall, I'm sorry, a Straight Wall. This is that Arzachel down here. Just to down here you can just kind of see this, this Straight Wall. It's some 60 miles long. Uh, less, less than a quarter of a mile wide, uh, but it's just an impressive, impressive feature. And what you're looking at is the shadow because you can tell from this crater the light's coming in from right to left. It's coming in from the east, east side. Mericrisium on the other side, again photo by Robert Reeves. You can almost envision two eyes, kind of a crab. It's a beautiful crater in the early, when the moon is in its early phase. Uh, one that I've taken of uh, Merihumerum on the east side. The moon is a wonderful topological playground. And we, uh, we were there six times. 69 all the way through 1972. We will get the question, can you see the flag? No, you cannot see the flag. Plain and simple. Um, the closest we've been able, the best resolution we've been able to get with Earth-based telescopes is anywhere from about three quarters of a mile to a mile. So there's no way you're gonna see a flag that's about four feet across. We can't even see the uh, lunar modules at the landing sites because they're only about 30 feet across. We do see the shadows of them with the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. So, with that, let's get back to the reason you're here. Take home message for telescopes is we want you to make an informed decision about buying scopes. We want you to choose wisely. We do not want you to make a choice you will regret. So please, stay away from the big box doors and scopes sold on purely magnification. In the Houston area, find one of the four clubs that's closest to you. Find out when they meet. HAS is on the first Friday. JSCAS is on the second. FBAC is on the third. NHAC is on the fourth. 
don't forget about the Orion telescope, uh, Orion catalog. Just go there and look. Star parties, find out when the club, when the star parties resume after this pandemic is over. Check the club's calendar, find out when they meet, look at the object, and look at the scope. Come to both observatories. Real quick, the four clubs, I have the four websites listed here in addition to Asset Club that's out in the East Texas area out near Beaumont. All, cl all these clubs are very good clubs. George Observatory, if you're familiar in the Houston area, down off of 59 or 288, it's at Brazos Bend State Park. East Dome, Research Dome, West Dome, Deck Scopes. There's an event we try to run in October. We don't know if we're going to run it in 2020. It's called Astronomy Day. We usually run it toward the end of October. Very popular, very popular event. Also up here is the Insperity Observatory off of Rankin Road and Old Humble Road, just short of Will Clayton Parkway. Do some fine work up there. All right, let's talk about scopes a little bit. I see a number of these on Amazon. Um, and I also see some of these, and they can be very, very tempting. I got good news and bad news about these scopes. The good news is the OTAs, or the Optical Tube Assembly, is probably pretty good. Probably got pretty good optics. Orion does not make bad stuff. Uh, it's probably a decent reflect, reflect, a refractor, ah, refractor and a good reflector. Bad news is I'm concerned about the mounts. The mounts may not be the most steady. In order to move it, you're going to twist these knobs in an azimuth and altitude manner. In order to move, an, in order to chase an object in the scope, you will have to turn one of the knobs. Grabbing that knob will send vibrations down to the mount, and the whole tube will vibrate a little bit. It depends how stable this mount is. You may end up wanting to remount this onto something more sturdy. That's entirely possible. Let's look at these. Let's see, this one is originally designed somewhat in a daub concept where this base plate is on a table and this top plate and the scope spin around it. And ideally, the scope is intended for tabletop use, and that's fine too. But they've also decided to put this on a mount. That's a big red flag to me because to me, anything above this arrow, your center of gravity is higher. I can see a modest sized child or a modest sized dog taking the scope to ground. I don't see a lot of heavy weight underneath to holding this thing down. So I'm, I, I'd be concerned about this. This one is a much more stable. It's probably a much heavier mount. Uh, pop quiz. Anybody tell me what the what the scope is? The Schmidt Cassegrain. Primary mirrors back here. Secondary mirrors up here. Eyepieces out there. On the flip side back here is probably the controller. This is probably in all likelihood a go-to. And that's fine. I believe this is in the upper hundreds, so it's not over a thousand, but this is a decent this is a decent scope. And it's relatively portable. This part detaches from the base. So it's it's not a bad scope. Let's come over here. These are Dobbs, bigger Dobbs. Uh, this particular one is an Aptura 12. Now I'll warn you right off the top. This is a 12 inch mirror. So this tube is probably bucking 14 inches across. From here, from the bottom plate all the way to the top, you're probably looking at about 6 feet. Your eyepiece is going to be up here, so that 11-year-old of yours is probably going to need a ladder to look through the scope. It's not going to be trivial to move this thing around. This entire tube will occupy one half of the back of my Prius, and I cannot really get this mount in there without taking the mount apart. So the views are spectacular. I mean, with 12 inches, this is an outstanding scope to have. But you've got to have the means to transport it if you ever want to go to dark skies. So one option is over here, the Orion. Now, this is the Orion and telescope. This is a push to. So this can come off the base, and these tubes can come off. So this becomes separate, and this can become separate, and it's a bit more portable than this one. But part of your assembly procedure is you'll have to align the primary with the secondary every time you put it together. But it's a bit more portable. 
So there are things to consider here. You gotta consider transport. What sort of astronomy do you wanna do? Size, there's a lot to consider when thinking about a scope. But as I said earlier, sight unseen, I'll recommend a six to eight inch daub, preferably the eight, um, to anybody that asks for a basic, basic scope. Stay away from the box scores, please. Box stores. Uh, these daubs uh, go for a few hundred. As I said, they're completely manual. And the dark side, if you decide the hobby isn't for you after a few years, these kind of scopes will actually have a decent resale value. So, all right. Final thoughts. Do your homework. Uh, locate a club near you. Let's talk about, now I've talked about uh, uh, Houston area. I'm sure there may be people that may view this that aren't from the Houston area. So you want to Google your town and astronomy club, for starters. Also, don't hesitate to go for the Night Sky Network. What is that? The Night Sky Network is set up by the JPL in Cal, near uh, Cal, at Caltech. Clubs trip over each other because they want to get involved with the Night Sky Network. Most of the clubs in the country are because the Night Sky Network offers the clubs educational perks. So it is definitely a mutualistic relationship. They like astronomy clubs and astronomy clubs like them. So what to do is wherever you are, put in your, your, uh, your state, zip, city, where you are, and the Night Sky Network will, can come up with possible clubs in your location. Strongly suggest you do that. So find a club in your area, go to their website, site, hopefully it's updated, and you can uh, connect with somebody in the club and go from there. When this pandemic mess is over, check their calendar when they start resuming uh, outreach events. Why would outreach events be a problem during the pandemic? Because it involves uh, my queuing up my scope, looking in the eyepiece, and then letting you look through the eyepiece. The eyepiece is a common point. Eyepiece can be a point of infection, unfortunately. So that's why most outreach has been suspended for the time being. A lot of clubs are trying to go virtual with that. But still, you can talk to the clubs even if they don't have an outreach event and you can connect with somebody in those clubs who can try to give you some additional advice. But if the opportunity ever opens up, locate, go to a star party, look at the object, most importantly look at the scope, and then factor in what do you want to do with the scope. Hint, that's why it's a personal choice. And with that, I appreciate your time. Um, any questions, you're welcome to hit me by email through one of the, through one of the clubs, Johnson Space Center Astronomical Society, or uh, questions below. Thank you very much.